All right, yes. Um, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for uh, this wonderful workshop over the last uh, three weeks and also for giving me an opportunity to first participate in it and also present uh, my work, our work here. Uh, so this is work done in collaboration uh, with Matthew Yuan, who's a expose and experimentalist, and I work, and Oriol Romero, is Oriol Romero Isat, in whose group I work, in the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Innsbruck. The work that I present is up on the archive, uh, if you, you can check this out there. Okay, here's a quick outline of my talk. I'll first in... Ah, okay. <laughs> So, uh, the, so I'll begin with an introduction to the talk, uh, to the subject that I'm talking about, uh, and I'll spend some time motivating uh, what I'm talking about, as well as uh, the mathematical description I'll use for the system that I'm talking about. That'll be the meat of the talk, actually. And then I'll present some results, a little bit of insight into the results, and then I'll conclude. Okay. So, in order to sort of uh, get to the general setting of the kind of systems I'm, talk I'm going to talk about, let's consider this phenomenon I'm talking about collective effects. So let's consider the phenomenon of superradiance, which was discovered by uh, Dickey in the 1950s. In its simplest avatar, all that you need is a bunch of atoms. Let's say that you pump all of these atoms into their excited state, and you can consider two very different situations. One, the atoms are all super dilute and they're very well separated from each other. And then you look at how they empty from the excited levels, hence their emission, and you see that when this when the cloud is really dilute, the emission time or the spontaneous emission rate is exactly the same as that of a single atom. Um, on the other hand, if you go to this opposite limit of a very dense packed collection of emitters, so much so that the separation, average separation between them is of the order of the wavelength of the light emitted, you get a very remarkable enhancement of the spontaneous emission rate um, that scales with the number of atoms n. This is superradiance. Okay. Let's understand this a little bit better. How does spontaneous emission come about? It's basically the interaction of atomic dipoles with the electric field modes of the vacuum. Okay. In a really densely packed ensemble, which are sub-wavelength, um, you can make a particular symmetry argument, which is called permutation symmetry, which assumes that the vacuum um, interacts symmetrically under exchange of the positions of the atoms. So this is permutation symmetry. This puts some very important constraints. For example, as you start with all atoms excited and sort of cascade down to the ground state, you're forced to go via only states that are symmetrized with respect to the atoms. This means basically you distribute the excitations with an equal superposition over the entire ensemble. OK, let's formalize this a little bit. You can model atoms as simply two-level uh, systems or quantum emitters, as they are known nowadays. Um, let's call uh, the the uh, two-level uh, Pauli operators corresponding to each atom sigma, sigmas, and the, these are some uh, ladder operators for these atoms. Um, and then let's call by S, the capital S, a collective operator uh, for the spins, which are made by summing over all of these atoms. And you can immediately realize that these symmetrized states that I talked about, which are also known as Dickey states, are nothing but eigenstates of this collective angular momentum, S square and SZ, with a per angular momentum j exactly equal to n over 2, where n is the number of atoms, which means basically the ensemble behaves like a giant dipole. Okay, and then if you, remember, if you recall that the emission rate uh, of a single atom is simply the natural spontaneous emission rate gamma times the population of the excited state, and then generalize this to the collective case by the collective operators, you can easily calculate the emission rate. And now, you, when you evaluate the emission rate at the different Dickey states, you immediately get an enhanced spontaneous emission that can, in, in fact, scale as n squared times gamma. So this is at the heart of superradiance. OK, why is superradiance interesting? First, keeping in theme uh, of uh, this workshop, it describes a very interesting open quantum system. It's also, as we'll show, there are induced vacuum-induced interactions, so it's also a many-body open quantum system. Um, since you sort of start with a completely uncorrelated set of atoms, all of them in excited state, and end up with coherent light when it emits super radiantly, there are some interesting connections to laser physics as well. There is a spontaneous synchronization of these dipoles as they emit. Um, the last thing that is super interesting about 
collective effects is that just as there are states that sort of radiate with a much larger rate, there can be states that do not radiate at all. For example, there was a talk last week from, uh, by Ganesh talking about such states, which are called subradiant states. And these can be super important in metrology and also for optical lattice clocks where you want to keep the, the coherence or the defacing low. So these are the interesting aspects. Okay, and I'd like to also make a case here for my particular problem that I'll talk about to sort of study these collective systems, not in regular atomic systems like what Sadiq was talking about uh, in the last talk, but more towards artificial atoms such as quantum dots, superconducting qubits, or nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds. Um, these are, I don't have to make this, uh, I don't have to like make a lot of sound about this because we've heard the amazing physics that can come out of such systems. But for the particular problem that I have in mind, here's why I want to use artificial atoms. Here's the system I'm interested in. Consider a uh, distribution of uh, quantum emitters in a 3D spherical volume. I don't care about uh, the material that makes up this volume. All that I want is that the emitters are sort of fixed inside this volume and they are all separated by a very small length scale, much less than the wavelength or of the order of the wavelength. And I'm also interested in driving this uh, ensemble of atoms in addition with an external classical electric field. And after doing that, I'm inter interested in what happens to the dipole force, which is recall is defined as basically the gradient of the intensity of the electric field times the polarizability of the ensemble. And I'm interested in how does the dipole force on such an ensemble get, get modified by the collective effects. And another interesting ingredient that usually is not included in such systems, which we include in our work, is a kind of defacing process. In the language of qubits or two-level systems, a defacing process is something that damps out purely the off-diagonal elements, and it comes from some noise process. The only twist here is that this noise process is somehow coherent over the entire length scale of the emitters. So in a sense, it acts collectively. I'll formalize how this happens in the next slide. It acts collectively. So this is what collective defacing is. OK. So in order to also convince you that what I'm talking about is not purely a theoretical question, um, I'll just present such a motivating experiment that came out uh, from a group in Australia where they looked at essentially nanodiamonds with a very, very high density of uh, NV centers, or basically two-level atoms. And what they looked at was how did the dipole force on this guy behave as they tuned the wavelength of this laser that drives uh, this, this diamond. The first result they found was that there was, this was an experiment done at room temperature, and they found that there was a significant component of the dipole force that came just due to the emitters. So this is a plot of the dipole force as a function of the wavelength, and these red dots are the force purely coming from the emitters. Because, uh, and you can distinguish this component because the diamond is a dielectric and you can also apply a dipole force, but the point is that the polarizability depends very strongly on the wavelength for the quantum emitters, but not for the diamond. So you can completely distinguish the contribution due to the, uh, due to the emitters or the two-level atoms. But the most interesting thing for me was that um, when they just took the dipole force coming from each of these emitters and had, they, they knew the density of the emitters and they could compute what's the total dipole force, just summing up the dipole force individually, uh, the value that they uh, sort of calculated, shown here in this dotted line, blown up. So this, this value was about two orders of magnitude less than what they saw in the experiment. And then they did a very simple model, including collective effects, and then they could immediately see that there is at least order of magnitude better agreement. And this kind of uh, experiment sort of motivates a sort of a better ab initio study of how dipole forces are modified by collective effects. OK, here's the mathematical description I'll use to model our system. It's basically a von Markov master equation. Rho is the density matrix, and these are the Liouvillians, and the Liouvi there, are two kind, there are three parts to our Liouvillian. Two of them are dissipative processes. One is a Hamiltonian process. Let's first look at the simplest of the dissipative processes, which is what I was talking about. It's a collective defacing process. People who are familiar with qubits, it looks like basically the usual P phi defacing, except instead of each of these individual sigma z's, what you have is basically the collective SZ operators of the spins. 
Okay, so if you look at the Hamiltonian, uh, there are two contributions. Let's first look at the free uh, term, HA, which has, again, two parts. The first part is just the energy of the emitters. Note that now I'm in a rotating frame where the detuning delta uh, denotes the difference in frequency between the driving and the natural frequency of the two-level atoms. The second term here represents the driving, and it, where omega naught is basically the Rabi frequency of the drive. We assume that this entire electric field is uniform over the volume of the emitters. As a result, we get a driving that is on the collective spin and not on the individual ones. OK, there is no inhomogeneous driving. OK, finally, let's look at uh, the interaction part. Both the interaction part and the dissipative part that I'll describe in a moment, um, the way to derive this is to start with two-level atoms or dipoles interacting with the vacuum modes of the electric field, and you integrate out the electric fields in a bond Markov approximation and get, the, get a resulting effective master equation. Yes. Yes. It's coming here. So this interaction is of the usual dipole-dipole form. And the strength of this, and it's a flip-flop in the operators, and the strength of this guy depends on the separation between the emitters. And it goes like this. For a pair of emitters, as a function of their separation, it goes as this 1 over r cubed form. One thing to note is that such an interaction can break this permutation symmetry that I talked about with my hand-wavy explanation of superradiance in the beginning. OK, let's now go to the dissipative process, which I call, uh, or which is called as cooperative spontaneous emission. This is how the dissipator looks. When you consider just terms, so m and n denote the uh, different emitters, when you consider terms with m equal to n, what you get is the usual spontaneous emission uh, dissipating operator. The interesting thing is in this case, you also have uh, correlated emission processes for m not equal to n, which, just like the dipole-dipole interaction, depend very crucially on the separation between the emitters. And, as you can see clearly, uh, once you are in this regime where the emitters are really, as a uh, over, in units of the wavelength, very, very closely packed, the uh, of diagonal term also saturates exactly to the diagonal contribution, and you can write the total dissipator in terms of just the collective operators. So this is just collective uh, emission, and this is what lies at the heart of superradiance, as I described in the beginning. No, it's in free space, completely in free space. OK, finally, to define the quantity that I'm interested in, which is the dipole force, this is just the gradient of the uh, driving term. Except, and apart from, the, uh, apart from the dependence on the driving field's profile, it's simply given by the average of the total polarization SX, the collective polarization. And our interest is to basic, our, our goal is to calculate the steady state of the master equation that I uh, showed you before and evaluate this SX there, and we have an access to the dipole force immediately. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yes. So this is what it is. So if the if all of the emitters lie on top of each other, basically this off diagonal part con sort of saturates, and you can write this dissipator as a collective dissipator. This is the Dickey model. Ah. That dissipator is purely, you start with uh, interaction of all the dipoles with vacuum, do bond, mo bond Markov approximation, and this is just the, I mean, it's the usual wigner weisskopf kind of treatment, but keeping in mind that the elect vacuum field, you should evaluate it at different positions of the atom. Exactly. They are all coupled to the same exact vacuum. That's the point. Yes. I mean, in some limit, of course, you can always argue so there is so okay so a memoryless bath so i have to have a bath that has flat density of states so 
Um, so, okay, so, so then I'll make the wager that if you, the same approximations you use to, de to derive a Lindbladian for a single spin, you can use this for the n-spin with the same approximation. There is nothing else special going on, at least as far as I know, but we can discuss this. No, it's, it's completely up, up. So you make exactly the same wigner weisskopf kind of approximations where you calculate the rate, but otherwise you don't do any approximation. Okay, sorry. Yes, it is exactly that. You end up with all-to-all -all coupling. Yeah. Okay, so then the quantity that I'm interested in, because what I was interested in was how does the dipole force get modified in a collective system? So I define a ratio of this dipole force, which is parameterized by this SX, uh, calculated for the collective case, divided by the same thing calculated for a bunch of emitters where I, by hand, turn off all the collective effects. So they just are like a bunch of independent emitters. And this ratio I call eta, and whenever this eta is greater than one, um, there is a cooperative en enhancement of the dipole force. Okay, let's look at the main results. So the question is, when do you get cooperative enhancement? So let's look at the simplest case, n equal to two emitters. Why is it simple? Because in this case, I can get a complete analytical solution for the steady state of the master equation. Uh, one of the reasons that is possible is because if I look at the dipole-dipole interaction term, which I denote by strength g bar here, uh, you can also write this in terms of collective operators for this case, because in this case, it trivially obeys permutation symmetry. Also, the dissipative part can nicely be divided up into a part that's completely collective, where gamma bar is this cross correlation rate, cross damping rate, correlated damping rate that I was talking about before, and a second part that is non-collective, where the sigma minus is this operator. And as before, you, note, you can notice that if you're in this extreme sort of close limit, uh, this gamma bar equals gamma over two, and this non-collective part vanishes, and you're left purely with a collective damping. I'm going to pause my time because it makes sense. Oh, OK, no, I can't pause my time. <laughs> OK, good break. All right, so um, all right. So in this case where you have two emitters sitting on top of each other, the emission is completely collective. And you can show from the exact analytical solution that you get cooperative enhancement as soon as you drive the system hard enough. So basically, the driving frequency should be larger than so the driving frequency should be larger than uh, all of the emission frequencies, uh, all the dissipation frequencies, and as well as the dipole-dipole interaction. So one can ask what's sort of a simple picture for this. Uh, a simple explanation for this uh, is to consider uh, what are the allowed states for just two atoms. Um, these are basically both atoms excited, both in ground, or a superposition of them, a symmetric superposition of them, these three states are symmetric with respect to atom exchange and the dark state, which is an anti-symmetric superposition. The key thing is that when you are in this completely collective ensemble, you get only dissipation via just three of these states, and you, you can restrict your dynamics just to the symmetric sector. On the other hand, sorry, on the other hand, when you have uh, the completely non-collective case, so the independent emission, then you have to include the emission via the dark state as well. And so you have to have four, all of the four states in your Hilbert space. And when you drive such a three-level or four-level system hard, you can sort of see from basic quantum optics that you sort of distribute the population over all of them more or less equally. And in this case, since you have lesser number of states, there is an enhanced occupation of the bright states, which reflects as an enhanced dipole force. Okay. But there is some problem with this sort of extreme uh, of this ideal limit. You can never put two emitters on top of each other. So um, because you will always have, in, in, unless R12 is 0, you always have this guy less than a half. You can't see it here, but you can see it here that it's, that it's never perfect, the collective emission. Secondly, there is this also this issue that if you go to really zero separation, your dipole-dipole interaction blows up. So one has to be sort of away from such an this is a very ideal picture. So it's also interesting to consider cases where you do not have perfect collective emission, because this is what's going to happen in any realistic system. And then you can parameterize to what extent your emission is collective via this uh, parameter, chi, which is always less than 1. 
And the immediate, it is in this sort of regime that we get our main result, which is that if you have such a non-perfectly collective system, and you consider the case where there is no collective defacing, um, you can show from the analytical solution that you never have a cooperative enhancement of the dipole force. On the other hand, as soon as you have a really large collective defacing, you can show that you will have a collective enhancement of the dipole force as soon as your pumping strength is, satisfies um, a very simple constraint. It should be large enough. It should be larger than the spontaneous line width. OK, this is not so important. Uh, so we didn't sort of stop at n equal to 2. We went to uh, about n equal to 12 number of emitters with some approximate methods, which I can talk about if you're interested in the questions. But with about n equal to 6 emitters, we can also do this exactly. We can solve the master equation exactly. And also, we considered completely randomized ensembles and averaged this uh, eta parameter, calculated this eta parameter, and averaged over many, many uh, many, many uh, tries, many, many configurations. And we saw that, the, for example, again, we see the same effect, which is that when you have uh, no collective defacing, there is no, collect there is no cooperative enhancement of the dipole force. This eta is always less than 1. The x-axis here is the average separation between the emitters in this ensemble. And as soon as you have uh, a large gamma c, which is my collective defacing, I have regions where my where there is an enhancement of the dipole force, provided I have enough driving uh, strength. And if again, I can explain in details if I have questions. So the answer is basically, when do you have a cooperative enhancement of the dipole force? Basically, in, in the regimes where you drive the system strongly and have a large enough collective defacing. So these are my conclusions. Uh, and maybe there's just one last thing I would say, the conclusions, most, most of them is not so important, but one thing that uh, I would like to say is that in, in, in a diamond system, in a, in a nano diamond system, such a collective defacing process that I described can occur very naturally because it arises from electron phonon coupling. And usually for a very small sized diamond, the phonon wavelengths can be large. So it can sort of, the phonon can encompass many of the emitters and hence the defacing noise coming from this process can be collective. And we're also looking to engineer this in a superconducting qubit with some experimenters in Innsbruck and so on. OK, thanks for your attention. We have time for two quick questions, because you are running late. Uh -huh. Yes. But we can put in inhomogeneity, and we see that up to, let's say, um, two or three orders of magnitude less, so 10 to the minus 3 times the collective defacing, this enhancement survives. So we can put inhomogeneous defacing as well. But it's we not like it, it doesn't get, it doesn't disappear as soon as you turn on inhomogeneity, okay. because it's very generic. That's the understanding. Uh, so do you have a geometric picture for this interplay of the driving and the the more spontaneous effects, how they they interplay in terms of on the block sphere or something like that? Or So for, for a single atom, yes. But uh, I mean, in the sense, yeah, I don't have a very easy picture. But the point is, it's clear that it's we are far away from low saturation. This is one thing I can say, uh, where I'm sort of driving the system super hard. I, I it's, it's definitely not a bunch of harmonic oscillators. That's that's the main difficulty, but I don't know. I don't have a very good picture. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.